All right. Well, welcome to the March uh, meeting of the Mount Diablo Astronomical Society. Thank you all for coming. Um, I am Tara Mostofi, uh, president. Um, we have snacks in the back. You all helped yourselves too. Thanks to Marianne for getting those set up for us again. Uh, much thanks to Marnie. I don't know where she went. There we go. Shout out to Marnie for uh, everything she does for the newsletter and keeping us all in line. Um, anybody needs to use the bathroom? It's around the corner here. Do we have any new members in the house this evening? All right, welcome everybody to the club. Um, really enjoy these monthly meetings. Uh, our agenda tonight, we're gonna have a quick introduction um, and an exciting announcement uh, with our Yosemite Parks coordinator, Renee Gandolfi. And then we have a very exciting Eclipse What's Up presentation by longtime member, Bob Miner. And he's actually a world re renowned Eclipse chaser and we're pretty, uh, Fortunate to have him speaking with us tonight. And then we'll have our main um, presenter speaking after a short break. Um, so I do want to uh, introduce Renee and have him come on up and give his announcement. Um, those of you that were here for, were at the last meeting, just when serendipity happened, Science News, their cover article was about Steve. And he came out like the day after our meeting. And our speaker is prominently featured in the article. So if you missed that, grab that magazine. Um, my announcement is that finally, after plague, fire, politics, reconstruction, uh, the summer annual Yosemite Star Party is going to finally happen again. Um, it's this summer. They are only going to have four weekends available to all the clubs in California um, because Bridal Veil um, Campground is still under snow um, and they're kind of limited in their um, various needs for the clubs that come and visit. So we are going to be with the Chalari Club. At this point, they are expecting two people. Um, so I don't think it's going to matter much. If you've never been to Yosemite, uh, one of these um, star parties, we go as volunteers for the park service, which means we are comped into the park and they let us use the volunteer campsites at Bridal Vale. They only have five campsites, which can park about 15 small cars, one large camper. Um, so don't bring a large camper, bring your little cars and we'll put everything up in tents. Uh, we've never had a situation where we couldn't fit everybody um, and stuff. Unfortunately, unlike previous years where we could bid for sort of the best weekend, which would be the new moon um, this year because we're limited to only four weekends and we didn't get to make a choice, we ended up with the last weekend in July, 26, 27. It's a waning gibbous moon. Friday night, the moon's going to rise about 11.15, and Saturday, it'll rise about midnight. So if you've ever been up there at Glacier Point before at about sunset, the eastern sky is going to start getting light probably fairly early. We're probably never going to have a really dark sky. If you're interested, get in touch with me um, by email um, and I'll respond. Um, we'll get a sign up list. Once I know who's planning to go, I can send you all the details about what you have to do to get into the park and all the camping and all that other stuff. Um, and if uh, you want to get a hold of me in the next couple of weeks, you'll have to do it care of Mazatlan. Um, so, um, I can give you more. There isn't a whole lot more information to give you if, unless you really want to go, because otherwise it's just a sheet of information. Mm -hmm. um, it's really cool because you just walk up there and just like a Diablo, they let you in and let you out without reservations at the park because we've already got them. If you want to go earlier than Friday night or stay later than sun Saturday night, you've got to get your own campsite. I will tell you that if you plan to stay later, it's a slam dunk because you're already at the campsite. And then Sunday morning, everybody else is clearing out from their Saturday night because they want to go home. 
and you just go pick a campsite and go to the camp monitor and go, hi, I want that campsite. And you usually get it. So that's the story, finally. Okay, thank you, Randy. All right, so moving on, I uh, just want to let you know that I do have the cards up front with our public astronomy nights. So if you have any outreach events and you want to pass these out, or if you want them for yourselves or grab a few to give to friends, they're up. I've got individual or packets, so make sure you grab those. Um, and then real quick, just uh, again, the upcoming star parties in May, we've got Cal Star coming up at Lake San Antonio. Uh, the Golden State Star Party in July, uh, Yosemite, Renee just talked about, and then Bancroft in, or Barcroft in August and the Cal Star in October. So lots of fun activities up and coming. Uh, so now I would like to introduce our main speaker, Bob Miner, to come on up to the stage. He's, or he's on the stage and I'm going to shift over the camera here. Oh, and I need to maybe stop my screen share. I'll turn off my PowerPoint, maybe. There it is. There we go. Uh, but not full screen. Sorry. Can you get the screen to be full? New. The pictures will be better. Full screen. I just make those guys go away. There you go. That's good. Hello. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the eclipse coming up. And um, in the way of introduction, I'll make this run. I've been going to eclipses for a long time. My first eclipse that I went to was in 1963, which scared me when I realized how many years ago it was. <laughs> This one in 1998 was. Can you turn up the yeah. microphone? How's that? No? Better? How's that? Can you hear me? Can I do that? I'll just do this. Do you want to hook it up a little uh, closer? No? That's okay. okay. I just hold it. Right. Unmute myself. My mute. Oh. oh no, don't unmute yourself. Yeah, you have to mute yourself again. I apologize. Sorry, folks. Oh. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's try again. 1998 in Curacao was a lovely eclipse. My daughter was in high school, and this is what she said when she experienced the eclipse. I won't read it out. You can read it. But, it's a how about is any better? A little bit. How, how about that? Is that better? Uh, zoom. Can Zoom hear anybody on Zoom? Can you hear me if I speak that loudly? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, so 1998 was a very nice eclipse. It rained on the way to the site, but it was still a really nice eclipse. Uh, this is not really... Oh, that's so weird. All right. Okay. So my first eclipse was in 1963 as a 16-year-old high school student. My parents loaned me the family car. I found riders at Cal shared the expenses, and had a wonderful time. In Washington, with the family along, we saw a little bit. When we lived in Hawaii, we saw, this is a fake photograph. It shows more than we saw. It never, you know, 90% chance of clear skies. People were worried about next week. Hawaii was a sure shot. We were living inside the path of totality. Curacao was lovely. 
Egypt was very special. China was also delightful. The clear, the clear gaps in some of the partial phases were courtesy of the Chinese government with the jeep with cloud seeding rockets on the back. The jeeps went by a few minutes later, we heard whooshing noises and the clouds magically parted so we could see the eclipse. Uh, from a boat in the Pacific in 2009, Easter Island in 2010, the Coral Sea in 2012, the Bermuda Tri Triangle in 2013. Notice the length of this eclipse, six seconds. This was from an airplane at 40, over 40,000 feet in the air, intercepting the tip of the moon's shadow. This is, this is quite, really wonderful fun. Uh, a normal airplane in the North Atlantic, and this is the, these are flash spectra at the beginning and the end of the totality. From a boat in Indonesia, Idaho, how many people were in Idaho? the eclipse or saw 2017. Is there anyone in the room who's never seen a total eclipse? Just a few. Okay. How many are going next week? Some. Yeah, that does uh, uh. <laughs> wasn't me. <laughs> And, and the last pictures I can show you from a, a, another airplane flight in 2019, notice the length of this eclipse. That's longer than you can see on the ground because the plane was going along with the shadow. 2020, it's COVID last year, family issues intervened and we, could, we couldn't do it. So what are we gonna see next week? The sun and the moon are sitting here is bright Venus. I'm not seeing it down here in the corner because of the, the, the uh, this stuff. Is there a way to make this go away? Well, you can fluff drag it, yeah. It always is my way too, yeah. Saturn and Mars, Venus, Jupiter. Mercury's not gonna be very bright, only about fourth magnitude. The comet is here. It's possible that you'll be able to see the comet the night before in the evening sky and during the daytime during the eclipse. Depends on your horizon and if it gets bright enough. I'm having trouble making this do what I want it to do. Uh, this, is a this is a prediction by this group that predicts what the corona is likely to look like. It looks like it's shimmering right now. That's different predictions. It's not what the corona will look like. The corona does, it's very static when you're looking at it. Motion is very, very, very slight. There are, um, Projects under, underway to actually record the changes over the time that it takes the eclipse to progress from across the United States, but you won't see it just looking at it. it it's static, but this is sort of the variation of what they're what they're expecting. Uh, come on, really? <laughs> I'm sorry. Ah, <laughs> uh, technical. Sorry, I'm sorry. Where did it go? I'm hiding on you. Where did it go? Um, maybe you can just get rid of that window, maybe? Yeah, just close that window. New share. You are screen sharing. Let me stop sharing and start over. We're back here. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, so we're at solar maximum. We're, we're almost at solar maximum. And so a hedgehog corona is what you're likely to see. This is what it looked like in 2012, a similar stage in the, in the solar cycle. Here in, in Walnut Creek, it's going to be a partial eclipse only. Uh, eclipse glasses or filters the full time uh, starting about 10 o'clock in the morning, maximum about 11 over by noon. Look about like that. 
And you've all seen eclipses, so you know that the photosphere is the dangerous part of this whole process. The chromosphere, the prominence is in the corona, are the fun parts. And you all know about the cosmic coincidence that the distance from the Earth to the moon and to the sun is the inverse of the sizes of the objects, so we get a full total eclipse most of the time. So like this is what we'll see this kind of week. And back in October, we had this, where we had an annular eclipse. That's this guy. Okay, so around first contact with filters are on or eyepiece uh, projection for a pair of binoculars or a telescope or with a pinhole, you can start to see a little nick taken out of the edge of the sun. And detecting that is always fun. My wife always spots it first either naked eye or with binoculars, whatever, she always sees it first. It's good to just look around and see what colors and shadows look like at that point. They look very normal. Shadows in particular, if you hold your hand out, they'll be sharp on both sides of the thing, of your, of your hand, nothing unusual. If there are animals around, see if there are any animals around, so you can keep an eye on them during the eclipse, see if they're aware of what's going on. And eventually you start to have a sense of the shadow approaching from the west. And when I'm just saying this, the hair on my arm is standing up, standing up because in Idaho, I don't know if you all had the same experience in, in 2017, that shadow, that's us, it came in over us like that. It just landed on us. It was the most amazing shadow experience I've ever had in any, any of these eclipses. My wife in Oregon, in, um, in Oregon, saw the shadow on a bluff go by the trailing edge of the shadow. The shadow is something really to pay attention to. It's really, it can be very exciting. Shadow bands on the ground near second contact is, is rippling. To see them effectively, you probably need to put something down on the, like a, a white sheet or at least a white piece of paper. Um, sometimes you see them, sometimes you don't. At second contact, Still with filters on, Bailey's beads, and even the, the and what other people will be calling out is saying, "Oh, look at that beautiful diamond ring," and I'm going to tell you, don't look at that diamond ring because you'll just get dazzled by it, and it'll spoil your view of the corona. Um, and also, it's very, very dangerous actually to take the filters off prematurely to try to catch the diamond ring. If there's a, a, the thinnest crescent of the moons of the sun's photosphere is still visible, it's dangerous. You just really don't want to stare at it. I have a lot to say about safety coming out. When it is safe, and the rule with, we use is looking through the filters or whatever it means, when you can no longer see anything, no Bailey's B, no bright spot through, then it's safe. And then you can have a wonderful time. I'm seeing the corona and the provinces. And next week, planets, bright stars, that comet, perhaps. And this is another really good time to look around. Uh, in, in Mexico and Texas, uh, totality is over four minutes. That's a long time. And you have time to look around and enjoy what's going on up above. But the corona and the provinces are the real, the, the real I was going to say the stars <laughs> of the program. <laughs> I didn't mean the pun. On, on, on one of the eclipses, I took time with a pair of binoculars to try to look at the Orion Nebula. And it, and it was a seven minute eclipse, I think it was, it was on one of the boats. And after a minute, I thought, what am I doing? There's the Corona, there's the Orion Nebula. Three months from now, I can go in the backyard and look at the Orion Nebula all night long. I can only see the Corona for another three minutes. So. Looking around is great, but remember the corona and the pro the prominence is you can look at almost any time with the hydrostatic scope. I do it all the time in the backyard. But the corona is the thing that's really the only time you get to see it. The third con contact is still the prominence. The prominence as the moon moves across, you see prominence on one edge and then the other edge as the moon, because the moon is a little bit bigger, it blocks it. No way of predicting whether they're going to be enormous or small, or there's almost certainly going to be something because we're so close to uh, solar max. The flash spectrum, I showed some pictures of that, is when the chromosphere becomes visible. And with the right technology, with diffraction grading or prisms and things, you can actually see that. 
And that's something, it's, it's really, really gorgeous. It lasts about two seconds. It's a very brief event. The diamond ring appears, and that's what the photograph is. These spikes, by the way, are courtesy of the Nikon lens that took the picture. Unless your eye is doing something really strange, you won't see spikes like that. And shadow bands again. And as soon as you, after you've enjoyed seeing that, and, and the reason it's called the diamond ring is because there's this ring of the inner corona and the diamond. That's, that's where it gets its name. It took me many eclipses to understand that. At fourth contact with the filters on, waiting for fourth contact, there's the, the um, uh, departing shadow. I have to take a, a brief break here for just a second. And avoid the disaster. We're just doing a quick setup here on the computer. What I'm trying to do is to get this booster battery plugged in so it will not go dead on me. Oh. <laughs> well, we'll have to switch. I have a backup. So one of the things you really, uh, this is, this is okay. um, I'm going to keep talking and then when this crap, we'll have to switch, switch over to that. Right. I'm really sorry. This is. Um, really important about the eye protection. ISO international standard filters are widely available. Use those. Older filters aren't necessarily any good. This the American Astronomical Society makes the point of buying from a known source and, and from their list. There's, there's a couple of printouts in the back that have this link on it. You could get also a, a sheet that describes it. Um, if you have old filters, be very careful with them. They may or may not be okay. I've, I've noticed that modern filters are much dimmer than the old filters were. And the modern filters block ultraviolet much better than the old ones do. It's, it's really worth using the new ones. If you use pinhole projection or skull projection, that can be okay. But the, the, the projected beam out of a pair of binoculars or a small scope can be dangerous particularly if there are kids around who will try to look through the telescope. So you have to be careful about that. A small mirror can be used like a pinhole to reflect an image onto a building. And avoid dazzling. Exposure is cumulative. The more you get dazzled, the worse it can get. At C2, when you can no longer see anything, that's when it's safe. Diamond ring for a few seconds. And most importantly, children are instructed to wait for an adult's okay to stop using their filters and when to start using them again. My two-year-old grandson is gonna be sitting in my daughter's lap and she's not gonna use glasses, she's gonna use only pinhole because he likes to put sunglasses on and look at bright things. So it's, be really careful with kids. If it's your first time, get comfortable, relax, skip the photography. But I encourage people to use their phones and make an audio recording. There are gonna be a million pictures online the day after the eclipse but there can only be one audio recording of your eclipse. And when I look back at all these eclipses, I enjoy looking at the pictures, remember the trips and all that. But the things I enjoy most is listening to what we were saying during the eclipse. And I haven't been able to find it, but on one of the long um, boat rides, about four minutes into the eclipse, you can hear one of the other passengers talking to a fellow passenger about when they're gonna do their laundry. <laughs> Enjoy the eclipse from the very beginning to the very end. And that's what this guy is all about. And I'll put this out so you can see it. That's the whole eclipse. It's not just the following. The celestial mechanics of the, of the moon going in front of the, of, the sun, of the sun, it takes a couple of hours. In China, I was taking a picture like that. Everybody else had packed up around the buses to go back to the hotel. 
And they were getting mad at me because I was waiting for last contact and a little beyond to take a picture like that. Even experienced people don't always wait till the end. Dazzling, careful use of the filters. Put the filter in front of your eye before you look up at the sun. Some people use red goggles. Some people put an eye patch on for one eye, saves a diamond ring for three contact. Um, the head of the of, of Griffith tells the story of using an eye patch and having a wonderful eclipse and the totality was over and he was still wearing his eye patch. He'd never taken it off. And as you can see my glasses right now, I watched the eclipse in Egypt like this instead of like that. My new glasses that I made, had made, so I have the latest prescription and all that for seeing, lived on my forehead during the town. It's estimated that you lose at least 20 IQ points. <laughs> it's true. It's true. It's also doing your third off. Yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 the other claim is that all eclipses only last 28 seconds. <laughs> but even they're eight minutes long. But this is also this is also important. Start out with the na your naked eye looking at the at the corona. If you got if you're gonna use binoculars, use the binoculars. And if you take the binoculars away, you won't see as much corona as you did at first. Because you the brightness of the image in the binoculars will cause your eyes to shut down a little bit. If you go to a telescope, it's even worse. The inner corona is nearly as bright as the full moon. So it's really very bright. The outer corona isn't. So if you make that inner corona big and your, your eye will adjust to that and you won't see as much in the corona. Use a timer of some sort, either your smartphone or a digital watch or whatever. So it goes beep, some people will be annoyed, but it goes beep at mid-eclipse in about 30 seconds before third contact as predicted. I use a, the world's most boring song, my, my wife calls it on the phone, to prompt me to take pictures and do various things. And on one of those, I did it wrong. And it said, okay, now it's time to look at the, look through the telescope. And I looked in the telescope and bang, diamond ring. Ooh. It was over because I'd misplaced that by about 20 seconds from where I wanted to be. But so it's really good to know that it's coming because then you can think what you're doing. We're traveling, this is logistics, so yeah. Um, Take it as easy as you can, stay healthy, avoid the flu, COVID. I'm wearing my mask tonight, not just to be paranoid, but I don't wanna get, nothing personal, but I don't wanna get sick just before the eclipse. I've gotten sick on almost every trip overseas, but always after the eclipse, because before the eclipse, I, am I just don't mess around. No street food, nothing funny. We're going to Mexico, I don't know how bad it is these days, but it used to be, you had to be really careful. Be extra careful before the eclipse and really enjoy yourself after. In China, there's a, a melon called the Hami melon, which shows up in stores here every once in a while. It is wonderful. And I resisted it till after the eclipse. <laughs> I'm glad I did, but it's it worth waiting for. Stay mobile, but stay in, try to sleep inside totality. Choose a good site, move early. Don't forget to cancel uh, sites like I did. Weather, drink lots of water. Um, you can read this faster than I can say it. Corona beer is traditional. <laughs> Photography, skip it except for that iPhone movie I was talking about. Keep it simple. Point and shoot cameras can do okay. Uh, so, you know, one of those pictures was an APOD. That APOD was taken with a point and shoot movie camera stuck out the window of the airplane as we went by. And it's one frame from that movie that I grabbed and sent in and it, it doesn't have to be fancy. I use Solar Eclipse Maestro, that's why I'm using this old computer. It's the last time I'll be able to use it because it won't run on new computers. Eclipse Orchestrator, Droid, those kinds of things are all useful, but if you haven't gotten your act together to use those already, forget it, it's too late. It takes too much, the, the learning curve is too high on all of those things to get something useful. And practice, 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 and battery life, and I brought the spare battery that's going to run this thing in, in Texas, but it's, but it's dead. 
So I you need a backup plan to your backup I plan, Bob. I didn't practice, practice, practice <laughs> this afternoon. I went through the thing, but I didn't check. There's a thing called Sun Sketcher. It's an app for your phone or your iPad or your Android. And I just heard about it the other day, and I, I'm going to try it. You load the app on your phone. You say start. You take your phone and you point it at the sun about five minutes before totality, and you let it sit till about five minutes after totality. And you take it down and say I'm done. And the app takes all those pictures that it's just taken, sends them off to the University of Kentucky. They look at all of those. They look for millions of them. They look for when Bailey's beads disappear and reappear. And from that, they'll be able to measure the actual shape of the photosphere to a precision of about five to six times better than it's known now. And it's wonderful citizen science, and you don't have to do anything. If you are taking photographs and, and, and using a camera for video, make sure the screen is covered or shielded so it doesn't annoy other folks. You're probably running out of town. And if you don't take photographs, paint a picture, make a sketch. This one is my grandson at age seven in Idaho. He scribbled that 10 minutes after the eclipse. This was China, this was uh, Coral Sea, and this is flash spectrum of Coral Sea. Okay, astronomers often disappointed by clouds, da -da -da. in any event, the main point of an eclipse, eclipse expedition is the fun, the challenge of an exotic location, and most of the eclipse data are never analyzed in public. I think that's true. Very much true. And I think that's it, except for lots of links. I'm showing them here so they'll show up in the recording, but there's also handouts in the back. You can copy them or take a photograph of them. So um, I'm, pointing, I'm pointing at the screen with my finger. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is the, the root source of most of the eclipse maps that you find. Xavier has been doing this forever. Ralph Chu is the world's acknowledged expert on eclipse safety. And there's a really good article that I have a reprint of there, but these links will get you there. There's a bunch of, a lot of misinformation about safety, about it's never safe to look even during totality. You do really want to be I want to emphasize, be really careful about the glasses. One of the worst cases of eye damage from 2017 was from a person who was looking at the eclipse. Well, one of the worst was on, with, with nothing for, for a minute or something. But one of them, somebody handed her a pair of glasses. She put them on and looked at the sun for 30 seconds. And she had permanent eye damage because those glasses were fakes. So really be careful that you know the source of the glasses. Um, if you insist on taking pictures with your phone other than the sun sketcher thing, it's a, uh, there's a website for that. Whether, uh, if, you can't, if you are mobile, if, I'm going to be north just west, northwest of San Antonio, I fear we have no chance to move. It's going to be gridlock because it goes just north of San Antonio. So half the people in San Antonio are going to drive north that morning to see the eclipse. It'll be impossible to move. So that's which is that's life. With, with this windy.com site is really good and you can get prediction days in advance. Um, Texas is about 50-50. Mexico's a little bit better. The rest of the country is much worse. Jay Anderson is a knowledge expert on eclipse weather, um, and that's his site. And these guys are the, uh, the, the current, those satellites, and they just ran out of talk, and they just ran out of computer. <laughs> I guess that's it. That was the next to the last slide. One is the win group. For the eclipse goes to totality, tell everybody turn off your flash. Yeah. Okay, Renee is telling for the Zoom members. Hey, let's get a turn off your flash on the camera. Before you drop the combination of dogs. At La Paz, I had uh, an eye patch on two hours before the eclipse and got a minute into totality. My friend said, picture, and we all just turned, and that was all I saw for the rest of the eclipse. The second is, one effect that you get is what I call a flip slide because you've got the sun as a slit instead of a disc. Shadows are sharp and 90 degrees away, they're blurred. And so you can do that with your hands or any sharp object and demonstrate that to people. And it's pretty cool to see that. It's just. Um, 
was one other thing, but I forgot now. <laughs> um, the other is if you've got any place where there are pinholes, you're going to get pinhole cameras and you're going to get partial eclipses all throughout. And if you happen to be under a palm tree or something else like that, it does it for you, but you can do pinholes with your hands where you can pre-drill some things to make few pinhole designs and then sell them later. Thanks, Bob. All right, real quick, Bob, how many eclipses have you seen? Bob has seen 14 total solar eclipses. Okay, who here has seen one? Raise your hands. Okay, anybody in, chat, in the chat want to tell us how many eclipses have you seen? Who, how many have seen two? Okay, three, four, wow, five, We're still going, six totals, seven, eight, oh, Renee might have you, ten, oh, nine. Okay, so Renee's at nine. <laughs> okay, um, how many are planning to view the partial from Danville? Here, okay. Anybody on Zoom want to chime in? Okay, uh, how many are traveling to be under totality? I would say, nice, thanks guys. I'd say probably at least a third of the audience here. Which I is don't know how to do it. <laughs> All right. Anybody on uh, the Zoom chat, feel free to give us your story. Okay, so we're going to take a 10 minute break. All right. I would like to introduce our main speaker for the evening. All right, so we are, uh, are privileged today to have our main speaker, uh, Dr. Oscar Macias. Uh, he is joining us via Zoom. Um, professor Macias is an assistant professor in multi-messaging -mess astronomy at San Francisco State University and a visiting scientist at the Center of Excellence in Gravitation and Astroparticle Physics, my tongue can't even say that, <laughs> at the University of Amsterdam. Um, he is a member of the Grand the Giant Radio Array for Neutrino Detection um, and CTA collaborations. He is interested in high, ultra high energy neutrino detection, gamma ray astronomy, and AI applications in astrophysics. You guys better all be paying attention tonight. <laughs> uh, he graduated with a PhD in astrophysics from the University of Canterbury. At the end of 2014, his thesis advisor was Chris Gordon, and before moving to his current position, he was a GRA PPA Prize Fellow at the University of Amsterdam. Um, so everybody, I would like to uh, introduce Dr. Macias. Um, uh, the Fermi bubbles, uh, gamma ray emissions from the Fermi bubbles. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Sarah, and thank you very much, everyone, for this lovely invitation. It's a real pleasure to be with you on this occasion, and I'm sorry I couldn't be with you uh, in person. But, uh, okay, so the plan for this talk is to uh, tell you about uh, our journey for the discovery of this object that you see here in this artistic render. So this is the Sagittarius Dwarf Sphero del Galaxy. And in 2022, with this group of people, uh, that are here, uh, we claim the discovery of this uh, dwarf galaxy in gamma rays. So let me basically uh, just show you how we we did that. Okay, so just to set the stage, let me start uh, with a brief introduction to this topic. So let's go back to uh, the 1948. So in 1948, very close to where we are, at the University of Berkeley, was detected an elementary particle called pions. So these pions are uh, so have the characteristic that they are very short-lived. They live only 10 to the minus seven seconds, so they have a very short lifetime. And when they decay, they become in two gamma rays. And so gamma rays are photons which are out a million times more energetic than the photons we can measure, we can see with our eyes, okay? So these are gamma rays. So shortly after the discovery of these pions, uh, this person that we have here, Satyu Hayakawa, 
predicted that the decay of these pions in astrophysical environments, in particular uh, places where there are high densities of gas, like hydrogen gas, atomic hydrogen, molecular hydrogen, we too observe large amounts of gamma rays. Because as I mentioned, these neutral pions decay and produce gamma rays. And so uh, this prediction was uh, confirmed by the uh, NASA facility, the Small Astronomy Satellite 2 in 1972. What you see here are gamma rays detected for the first time uh, from uh, the center of our galaxy. And so you see uh, a lot of photons that are correlated with atomic hydrogen, which basically confirms the prediction by uh, Sati Hayakawa. So a few years later, this is now a satellite that was uh, launched by the uh, European uh, the space agency is COSBY. They confirmed, so with more statistics, they confirmed the uh, original detection by the SAR satellite. And as you can see, they have more statistics, so they were able to observe more photons. And for the first time, they observed a uh, high energy object like you see here. These are supernova remnants, so a couple of supernova remnants in the plane of our galaxy. So these are galactic. Uh, coordinates, and uh, in this plane, you see our galaxy, and these are supernova remnants from our galaxy. And later, uh, this is now a NASA satellite, this is called the Egret satellite, and with yet more uh, sensitivity, they were able, to, for the first time, to detect gamma ray objects which are of extragalactic origin. So, these objects that you see here are from our galaxy, so supernova remnants here, mostly supernova remnants, but objects like this, these are extragalactic in origin. These are blazers or active galactic nuclei. And these objects are related with uh, supermassive black holes in extragalactic environments. So I'm just basically setting here the historical context for, for our discovery. So this is basically what we, uh, so the point here is, uh, this is the build of gamma ray astronomy, uh, basically with the uh, uh, prediction by Satyu Hayakawa of these gamma rays and later with the actual discovery of gamma rays by the satellites. All right, so this is a comparison of the gamma ray sky as seen by these uh, legacy detectors such as IGRIT, this NASA facility, and now this is a state of the art so you see here, this site is with the predecessor of the state-of-the-art gamma ray satellite, which is Fermilat. And then here you see the image now with much higher resolution, much higher number of photons detected with uh, the Fermi uh, satellite, the uh, state-of-the-art uh, gamma ray telescope. And th this is uh, the newest uh, image of the all sky as measured by the Fermilat. So Fermilat is an orbiting uh, satellite. You see here uh, so, sort of a cartoon version of the satellite. It observes all the sky almost every three hours and it has been running for about 15 years now. And this is a very uh, clear image of the sky. So most of what we see here, so as I mentioned, the galaxy is observed in the plane, so uh, this is these are galactic uh, coordinates, and this red, uh, yeah, the red color here shows the what we call the diffuse gamma ray emission. So this diffuse gamma ray emission is produced by the interaction of very energetic protons or electrons that interact with interstellar gas, and so these high energy protons collide inelastically with hydrogen and then produce pions, neutral pions, which decay and produce these gamma rays. And so since there are a large number of these high energy protons, then they produce a diffuse emission of gamma rays. So most of these are diffuse gamma rays from the interaction of these cosmic rays with interstellar gas. But we also observe these so-called point sources which as I mentioned, 
are mostly at high latitudes and low latitudes are mostly of extragalactic origin. So these are either pulsars or uh, blazars or AGMs. Okay, so shortly after the uh, observation by Fermilat of the gamma ray sky that we see here, uh, researchers created models to explain these observations. And so uh, what we see now here is uh, a result of the analysis by a group of people from the University of Harvard, Sue's Latin and Finkbeiner. So what they did back in 2010 was they created, as I mentioned, an uh, analytical model for this sky, for the gamma ray sky, and then they took this mall and subtracted the mall, the, subtracted the mall from the data. And so this is what's called a residual image. So just the gamma ray observations minus the uh, model for the gamma ray sky. And so you see most of what we observe is uncorrelated gamma ray emission. These are just random noise. These are, this could be uh, basically uh, mismodeling or basically regions where the model was not able to explain the data very well. There are some or regions that are clearly uh, mismodeling of interstellar gas, mostly in the galactic plane, but the uh, exciting part of this article written by these Harbor researchers was this clear uh, axis of gamma radiation emanating from the center of the, of, of the galaxy. So what you see here is the so-called Fermi balls. So they look like balls. They uh, extend up and below the galactic plane about 7 kiloparsecs. So that's about uh, 23,000 light years from up from the center of the galaxy and below the center of the galaxy, almost symmetrically. It's not clear uh, what is the source of these of this Fermi balls, of these giant lobes of gamma radiation. Uh, there are, a, there, yeah, there is a lot, there are a lot of discussions in, in our community for what could be the source of these structures. But uh, there is some sort of consensus that uh, it has something to do with energetic activity from the nucleus of our galaxy. So it is either related with the uh, physics of the supermassive black hole, so the Tarius A star in the center of the galaxy, or some sort of winds from stars, from young stars in the nucleus of our galaxy. Okay, but it's not very clear what is, what is the source of this. Of these of these Fermi balls. Okay, so that was back in 2010, and just basically providing the context for the uh, discovery of the Sagittarius dwarf. And so, a couple of years later, a subset of the Harbor researchers, Suan Finkbeiner, 2012, they detected another discovery within the Fermi balls. So now what we are seeing here is a box of 120 degrees around the center of the galaxy. These are no these are not observations, but these are uh, models. And so what you see here is a model. It's just a template or a map that the researchers came up with to explain the Fermi balls. So you see here a map or a model template for the Fermi balls. This is the map. So the Fermi balls. This is a model for the galactic disk. So the gas and the stars in the plane of our galaxy. And this hole is a mask. They just didn't want to model in their analysis. And the new claim in this paper was these features here, which they claim, claim are uh, evidence for AGN-like activity, so active galactic nuclei, so basically jets from the supermassive black hole. Uh, and so the uh, jet-like feature in the south has a very particular uh, morphology. Uh, it looks like a cocoon, and so it's called the Fermi cocoon. Uh, so this is the this jet-like feature in the south, and then uh, there is also kind of a symmetric counter-propagating feature emanating uh, 
according to the researchers from the supermassive black hole. Now, this feature in the south has been confirmed by subsequent analysis, including the Fermilab collaboration, so the uh, collaboration who actually launched the, 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 the telescope and know very well their data, but this feature in the north, so this jet-like feature that was claimed, uh, has not been confirmed by subsequent analysis. So the feature in the south, this Fermi cocoon appears to be real, but since this northern counterpropagation feature has not been confirmed, it's not clear if uh, this substructure within the Fermi balls is actually due to the uh, supermassive black hole. Okay, so this is a big puzzle in astrophysics. So what are what is originating or inflating the uh, Fermi balls uh, from the galactic uh, from the galactic center, and also what is the source of this brightening towards the south uh, in the southern part of the Fermi balls? Okay, so this is a more view of the Fermi balls. Uh, so these are again galactic coordinate. Uh, galactic coordinate. This is an all sky image. It's a state of the art image produced by the Fermilab collaboration now in 2014, and very clearly we can see again this brightening towards the uh, south in the southern lobe of the uh, of the Fermi balls. Okay, as you can see here, there is nothing like the uh, Swamp Thing Binder claim. There is no the clear brightening or a jet-like feature in the in the north, but the one in the south definitely appears to be real. Okay, so this is back. This was back in 2014. These are this is an gamma ray image uh, produced or measured by the Fermilab collaboration. And now I'm going to show you a completely different image. This is no gamma. These are no longer gamma rays. This is an image produced by Gaia, right? And so this is an image of stellar populations in or uh, basically in the sky as seen by Gaia. And the uh, particular stars that uh, Gaia is observing here are our LIDAR uh, stars, which are uh, body all stars and um, are used in astronomy as uh, distance la uh, later, uh, like, um, uh, to, uh, basically, we can measure the distance uh, very precisely to these stars, our, our liners. And so, okay, uh, we are seeing RR LIDAR stars with uh, Gaia. So you see here the RR LIDAR population from the large Magellanic clouds and the small Magellanic clouds. And we see here the stellar population associated with a satellite galaxy of the Milky Way. So this is the Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy, and I'm going to provide a bit more details uh, in a few seconds of this galaxy, but uh, for now it suffices to say that uh, is the third most massive satellite of the Milky Way. And there is some uh, stars that are also seen here. These are called, this is the so-called Sagittarius stream, and uh, we are going to see uh, some rendering where we are going to find, basically understand that these are essentially stars that are being disrupted from the core of this uh, of this, of this uh, Sagittarius dwarf. Okay, so this is, as I mentioned, uh, this does not appear related at all with the Fermi balls. Fermi balls are some structure measuring gamma rays, these are stars. But this uh, observation, this paper appeared in 2019 and we uh, noticed the following, we made the following observation. So we realize, so you see here, this, uh, this is the region where you see the Fermi cocoon, this brightening between the Fermi balls, and this is the place where the Sagittarius dwarf is located. Now, here is a zoom in of the gamma rays. Again, please notice here this uh, elliptical region here. Sorry about that. And uh, again, 
this is the same place in the sky, and that's where the Sagittarius dwarf is located. So we notice that there is uh, this very special um, spatial overlap. So uh, you see that they coincide especially these two structures, and then we wonder where they were actually related to each other. Okay, uh, so basically the chance coincidence for these two uh, objects, the Fermi Cocoon and the Sagittarius Dwarfs through the galaxy, is only 1%. So that uh, the fact that this coincides especially only by chance, and that's and that's only considering the fact that uh, that's even we are considering the fact that they have similar orientations, as you can see here. All right, so this is uh, the, again, so this is the gamma ray sky, and then these contours here show you the, uh, basically the density of the stars overlapped on top the uh, gamma ray structure. So the question then that we ask is where this spatial overlap is not just random uh, uh, overlap. So we want to uh, ask where they two are actually physically related, all right? So that's basically uh, the main point and the main um, the main objective of this of this article. Okay. So as I mentioned, so this is basically this uh, the illustration that is at the that was at the beginning of my talk. You see here this artistic rendering of the Fermi balls, please remember. So the Fermi balls, we cannot see the Fermi balls with uh, traditional optical telescopes. These gamma rays are, uh, so to observe gamma rays, we need very special detectors. In fact, the gamma ray telescopes are uh, particle physics detectors, right? So we don't observe gamma rays with traditional uh, telescope. We actually use some uh, particle physics technology to observe uh, the gamma rays. And so this is basically how our galaxy would look like if we could use some gamma ray goggles. And uh, here you see the Sagittarius Dwarf galaxy. All right, this is the stellar stream that I mentioned a few slides before. And you see this stellar stream that is associated with the Sagittarius Dwarf actually wraps around our galaxy several times. These here is also uh, are also stars that are basically disrupt are basically being disrupted from the uh, from the dwarf uh, from the dwarf uh, from the Sagittarius dwarf spheroidal galaxy. Essentially, what happens is that as the galaxy the Sagittarius dwarf galaxy interacts with uh, gravitationally with our galaxy the uh, gravitation, so basically there is a gravitational, gravitational harassment that essentially disrupts the stars and produces these uh, streams of stars uh, that wraps around uh, our galaxy. So the Sagittarius Dwarf is located about 26.5 kiloparsecs from the sun, from us, so that's about 90,000 light years away from us. And the mass of this object, of this satellite of the Milky Way, is about 100 million solar masses. So it's very, very massive indeed. So our hypothesis then is the following. So this is kind of a profile view of the galaxy. So you see here our galaxy. This is just an artistic rendering. You see here our galaxy. This is the Sagittarius dwarf, which is in the pro which is moving up, is moving towards the north, and it's about to cross the plane of our galaxy. And this is the uh, this stellar stream corresponding to the stars that are being disrupted from the Sagittarius dwarf. So our claim in this paper is that we are seeing from our location, we are seeing the Sagittarius dwarf throw the Fermi balls, okay? And so this brightening, so our hypothesis then is that this brightening of gamma rays that we observe 
in this structure in the Fermi balls is actually not part of the Fermi ball. So let me go back to there. So we are claiming that this brightening of gamma radiation is actually not part of the Fermi balls, but it's rather gamma radiation emanating that is being produced from the Sagittarius dwarf, which basically from our perspective is behind the Fermi balls. And so these gamma rays are essentially passing through the Fermi balls and appear in projection to be part of the Fermi balls, but yeah, in fact, we claim this is actually, these are actually gamma rays produced by the Sagittarius dwarf. And so we claim the discovery of the Sagittarius dwarf in gamma rays. So this is essentially the claim of, in, our, in our paper. Okay? By the way, so let me, let me stop here and ask you if you have any questions or comments, please speak up. Please feel free to stop me at any time. So maybe if you have any comments or questions, this is a good time to uh, stop. So this is basically the, the claim for the main claim of our paper. Hey, Essentially, yep. Yeah. Question in the back here. Perfect. So, so my, 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 hello, what's over here? Uh, my, my, my question is, um, what kind of analysis has been done stars or is or, or the, my first question is is there a black hole in the center of the Sagittarius dwarf galaxy and and what, what kind of analysis have we done of, of uh gamma ray sources that could be in the in the dwarf galaxy that's an excellent point yeah so definitely um there are uh there are uh a stellar mass black holes that are being measured that have been measured in the Sagittarius dwarf um, so these are black holes that are nowhere near the mass of uh, Sagittarius star in our, in our galaxy, definitely. So there is, uh, in the center of the Sagittarius dwarf, there is a global cluster, and so global clusters have very high densities of stars, and so um, in these uh, stellar environments, there are high chances for uh, neutron stars for black holes, and so definitely we expect a number of black holes there. And uh, in terms of, uh, and so I'm basically going to describe uh, uh, later in my talk a little bit more on what we know, what what could be the gamma ray emitters there. But um, uh, yeah, definitely there is, uh, as I mentioned a global cluster in the center of the Sagittarius dwarf, and we know there should be, there is a uh, stellar mass black hole there. Does that answer your question? So I'm going to provide, I'm going to provide a little bit more details about uh, more potential gamma ray meters in a later part of, of my talk. But for now, yeah, yes. that, I, I would say that, that answers my question for now. Actually. Okay, perfect, yeah. So. The second part of your question is going to hopefully be respond uh, answered in the uh, at a later stage. Yes. Have you has anyone uh, observed any similar phenomena around other galaxies? Excellent. So that's my that's my next slide, basically. <laughs> so, <laughs> so in just a, a couple of minutes, I'm going to respond to that question. Yes, but uh, that's like a very good point as well. Yeah. So that's my second slide to, from here, yeah. Any more questions on this or comments? No current questions here. Okay, perfect, okay, so let's go on, yeah. So hopefully we, we will uh, answer these uh, very nice questions. Okay, so now people have run uh, simulations for the uh, formation of the Sagittarius Dwarf and so this is uh, this is one of the state of the art numerical simulations for the uh, formation of the Sagittarius dwarf. This is uh, written in this article here by Grace Lara et al. Um, just one second, okay. And so the main idea in this uh, article is that the Sagittarius dwarf started as a very heavy uh, object, so something like 10 to a 9 solar masses, close to 10 to a 10 solar masses, 
that's about uh, a thousand million solar masses. And then they just run the simulations based on what we know currently of the kinematics of the Sagittarius Dwarf. And they run the simulations for billions of years. And uh, they essentially predict that the Sagittarius Dwarf has crossed our galaxy several times. Each time that it crosses through the plane of our galaxy, it has incited a stellar formation activity. So you see here our galaxy, and you see here now that there is a star formation activity happening in our galaxy just because of the ripple effect of the impact of the Sagittarius Dwarf with our galaxy. So essentially, I imagine you drop a stone in a, a tank of water, and so the uh, modulations of the water basically give you the density of interstellar gas. And so where there are, when, where there is high density of, of gas, there is a star formation. And so essentially this paper claims that uh, the Sagittarius Dwarf is responsible for a lot of star formation activity in our galaxy. And so you see here basically that uh, essentially the Sagittarius Dwarf ignites a stellar formation in our galaxy but also the gravitational harassment of our galaxy disrupts the galaxy itself. And so you see that it starts whole, and then once it interacts with our galaxy, it starts developing this stream of stars. And so it has crossed our galaxy three times in, it, in, in its history, according to our simu to simulation by the community. And... Uh, those interactions, as I mentioned, uh, are responsible for these very particular and actually beautiful stellar streams that uh, wrap around uh, our galaxy, okay? Very well. So now back to um, this nice question that was just asked. So how, what other objects do we know that can also produce gamma rays uh, uh, that are satellite for galaxies? So these are the uh, most massive satellites of the Milky Way. So these are dwarfs, spheroidal galaxies of the Milky Way. And actually, the two most massive satellites are the Large Magellanic Cloud and the Small Magellanic Cloud. And the third most massive satellite is the Sagittarius Dwarf. So there are some other, like for instance, the uh, for NAX is also the fourth most massive satellite of the Milky Way. Uh, these two, interestingly, the two most massive satellites have been detected in gamma rays. So large Magellanic cloud and a small Magellanic cloud have already been detected by Fermilat in gamma rays. And essentially, the Sagittarius dwarf before our paper was the third most massive satellite of the Milky Way that was not detected prior to our, our, our article, okay? And so, so this is kind of uh, circumstantial evidence that uh, what we are seeing uh, makes sense, okay? Very well. So, uh, the, uh, and so now let me provide some, a bit of technical details of our, of our uh, analysis. So what we did was we analyzed Gaia data, so we have a catalog of 200, about 200,000 stars. These are mostly our, our LIDAR, but also red clump giants. Uh, there is a mix between these two. And you can see that uh, this doesn't have the traditional spherical uh, morphology that you will expect from those of the galaxy. You see that it looks like uh, it has a cometary shape. And it's basically because of this disruption of the produced by the gravitational field of our galaxy. Um, so you can see here, so this is uh, how big in, in the sky it looks like. It, so these galaxies is difficult to observe with traditional telescopes because it's basically behind the, so, you could, so to see it, you need to see through the galactic disk and it's also very close to the galactic bulge. And so you see, you need uh, very precise 
telescopes to observe it and also you need to uh, somehow be able to remove the foreground the stars of the stars from the from our galaxy to uh, obtain this uh, morphology or to obtain this model this major uh, or empirical model for the Sagittarius dwarf. So you see also here, uh, essentially, uh, a, a profile of the density of a star. So you see that towards the core, where the global cluster is located, there is a very high density, a very large number of stars. So this is a, a single 0 0.1 degrees times 0 0.1 degrees. There are of order 3,000 stars. 3,000 stars in basically a 0 0.1 degrees square region 3,000 stars easily uh, detected by Gaia uh, towards uh, the Sagittarius dwarf. Okay, so the statistical test that we did, so let me, so I'm going to be very brief here. This is a bit of a technical detail, but uh, so this is mainly to show you why we are confident on uh, this result. So essentially what we did was we took this map of the stars and then we did uh, a traditional uh, statistical test to see what was uh, uh, what basically the significance, the statistical significance for this correlation, this special correlation between the gamma ray map and the stellar map. And so you need to worry about all these numbers here. So essentially, what this table is, uh, the gist of this table is that. There are large uncertainties on the astrophysical background, so namely, what are the gamma rays that are produced by interstellar gas, the gamma rays that are produced by the interaction of electrons with the interstellar radiation field. Uh, there are also uncertainties related to the model used for the Fermi balls. And essentially, we repeated our statistical analysis with different potential models, which all on their own could be argued to be possible astrophysical background models. And so essentially, as you can see here, for all these model variations for the astrophysical background, we were able to detect this correlation between the stars and the gamma rays with a very high significance. Uh, so indeed, with a significance larger than five sigma, which is the standard a statistical significance necessary to claim uh, discovery in our field. So five sigma statistical significance in our uh, high energy astronomy, uh, gamma ray astronomy is uh, the threshold for discovery. And so for all these astrophysical backgrounds, which are all potentially uh, physically plausible, we detect very uh, strongly the uh, this correlation between the stars and the gamma rays. Okay, so this. Okay, so okay, so now we are going to move to the next stage of our of our analysis. So as I mentioned, we essentially were able to uh, with the statistics confirm that there is a correlation between the stars and the gamma rays. And now what we are going to try understand is how the gamma rays from the Fermi cocoon are physically related to uh, the stars from the Sagittarius dwarf. Okay, very well. So, okay. So uh, the first thing to note is that uh, people have demonstrated using simulations that the Sagittarius dwarf, due to a tidal and ramp pressure stripping of the gravitational tides of our galaxy, it has lost most of its gas. So the Sagittarius dwarf in, in the pre at present doesn't have pretty much uh, any uh, atomic hydrogen. Also, we know that at present, the Sagittarius dwarf is not uh, producing new stars, so there is no star formation in the Sagittarius dwarf. And so, if there is no target gas and there are no star formation, there are basically no, there is no way to accelerate protons at very high energies. And if there is no target gas and no high energy protons, then there cannot be this pi on zero gamma ray emission that we have um, uh, discussed in the previous in the previous slide. So definitely. 
pion zero gamma radiation is not responsible for these gamma rays. And as I'm going to show you here, the other possibility that has been discussed in our community is that since these uh, dual spheroidal galaxies of the Milky Way, there are about 45 that are known currently, all of them have very large amounts of dark matter inside them. And so, in fact, the amount of dark matter is larger than the amount of mass in a the amount of a stellar mass. And so, there are particle physics models that predict that the annihilation of these dark matter particles, these are hypothetical particles that could produce, in principle, gamma rays. And so, we also contemplated that hypothesis. And so, I had a uh, master student in Australia, Thomas Benville, who run some hydrodynamical simulations for the distribution of dark matter in the Sagittarius Dwarf. And so you see here the results of his simulations. Uh, you see here the core of the Sagittarius Dwarf, and this is the stream of dark matter particles that come out from, the simula from his simulations. He is assuming of these dark matter simulations. And so we took this dark matter map and then we tested through, we passed it through our statistical pipeline, and we found that there is no spatial correlation between the dark matter template or the dark matter map, this dark matter map, and the Fermi cocoon. And so, therefore, we were able to rule out the hypothesis that the Sagittarius dwarf is due to dark matter annihilation. Okay, so it's not pion zero gamma rays produced by the interaction of cosmic rays with interstellar gas. And it's also not due to its hypothetical dark matter particles annihilating and producing gamma rays. And so the only remaining credible hypothesis is the uh, hypothesis that there is a large number of undiscovered means a pulsars in the Sagittarius dwarf that are producing gamma rays. Okay, so means a pulsars are neutron stars, rapidly rotating neutron stars. So, uh, in fact, a millisecond pulsar can rotate around its own axis about a thousand times per second. So these are very, um, uh, uh, very fast spinning uh, neutron stars. And so neutron stars are all the size of a city, or all the size of San Francisco. They are very small, but they are very massive. So they have the mass of about uh, the sun, but com compressed in the size of a city. So they are very energetic, they have very strong magnetic fields, and they are very good at emitting gamma rays. And one of the nicest characteristics of these objects is that they are also very old. They are as old as, as these are our LIDAR stars. They are very old star population, and they can be remain producing gamma rays for a long, long time. Okay, and so uh, we essentially uh, started uh, contemplating this hypothesis that perhaps these gamma rays are produced by gamma radiation from the Sagittarius, from I mean, the pulsars inside the Sagittarius dwarf. Okay, so what you're seeing here is the photon spectrum that we observe from the Sagittarius dwarf. So these are, this is the energy, and these are the photons per unit of second, per centimeter square, so per unit area, and per unit solid angle. And so this is the spectrum that we observe, and so we run some uh, simulations of, for the uh, millisecond pulsars that could leap in the Sagittarius Dwarf, and from our modeling, we find that the low energy spectrum can be explained by the so-called magnetospheric gamma radiation. So how it works is these neutron stars, these rapidly rotating neutron stars, they lose their rotation energy by accelerating electrons and positrons from their surface. And then these electrons and positrons are accelerated by the uh, electric and magnetic fields in the pulsar magnetosphere. And then as they are accelerated, they produce gamma radiation. And so this gamma radiation can easily explain this 
low energy gamma radiation that we observe from the inside the dwarf. And for these high energy photons, we were able also to uh, explain it by noticing that these electrons that produce the gamma rays close to the pulsar magnetosphere, they just propagate into interstellar medium, and then they are able to upscatter interstellar, they, uh, essentially, photons from the cosmic microwave background. So you have a bunch of photons that are low energy, so they are photons from the uh, beginning of the universe, they are there, and then these electrons have very high energy and they can collide with the causing a quaver ground photons and then inject them much more energy. So basically upscatter them. And essentially these high energy gamma rays can be explained by this so-called inverse Compton radiation that is produced by these energetic electrons upscattering uh, causing a quaver ground photons. Okay, so as an example for this process, uh, you see here the uh, photon spectrum. So this is now from a global cluster that we analyzed in 2021. So this is the uh, Tersan-5 global cluster. This is the spectrum that we observe from this object. And we are also able to explain the gamma rays that are detected from Tersan-5 with a combination of the magnetospheric gamma radiation from the millisecond pulsar that we now leap in Tersan 5, and also the high energy gamma rays can be produced also, can be explained by these electrons that are upscattering cosmic microwave background photons in the surrounding interstellar uh, field. Okay? So, Okay, so uh, essentially we find that this model makes sense, that the millisecond pulses can, can explain the spectrum, can also explain the spatial morphology of the gamma rays that we attacked. So let me skip this uh, figure because I'm a little bit uh, behind time, but let me just mention uh, one of the most important implications of our results is uh, uh, this. Uh, so, essentially, there is okay. So there is a big community uh, in physics who are trying to explain what is the nature of that matter, and so uh, that's one of the most important questions in modern science: what is the nature of that matter? And so there are. Uh, researchers who claim that dark matter is made of a special part, kind of particle which is called weakly interacting massive particle. And these weakly interacting massive particles have the property that once they encounter each other, they can destroy each other and produce gamma rays. And so there is a big project that uh, uh, basically uses all the gamma ray facilities and they are trying to score the gamma rays from regions where there are high concentrations of that matter. And so one of the best places to look for these hypothetical signals are these satellites of the Milky Way. So the reason is that these satellites of the Milky Way have been stripped of interstellar gas and they pretty much are very, in principle, clean background. So they just have, in principle, stars. And so they are considered to be very clean to attack, for, to look for these dark matter signals. And so far, people have not detected any conclusive signal that can be attributed to dark matter. Now, what people thought in our community was that, that the, these satellites of the Milky Way, these uh, dual spherical galaxies, were the best target, were our best bet to detect dark matter self annihilation. Now, what you're seeing here in this figure are this is a list of all the um, dual spherical galaxies of our Milky Way. And this is the flux, so the uh, black points show you the gamma ray flux that is expected from these particle physics models of that model. And so 
People believed, as I mentioned, that these were very clean backgrounds, that they, nothing could outshine our matter signal, and that, and that if we detected any gamma rays from these objects at this level, that would be a smoking gun signature for that matter. Now, what we are showing here, so the red points show you that if we extrapolate the results for the Sagittarius dwarf to all dwarf spherical galaxies of the Milky Way, in particular for NAX, sculptures, exons, etc. In fact, we find that uh, potential sources, potential millisecond pulsars living in this uh, object could outshine the gamma rays that are expected from this from these low spherical galaxies. So this essentially cast doubt on uh, Sagittar on, on dwarf spherical galaxies being uh, essentially clean targets to detect for to detect these dark matter signals. As you can see here, for instance, uh, the most massive satellites are also expected according to our results to contain a large number of pulsars and produce a lot of gamma rays from pulsar emission, but also there are some other objects for which definitely the gamma rays that are expected from millisecond pulsars is much weaker than the gamma rays that are expected from these hypothetical dark matter particles. Okay, so that's an important message for the particle physics community that comes out from our results. Okay, so and now uh, arriving to the conclusions and uh, future work. So we are, so since we are essentially claiming that there is this large number of new millisecond pulsars in the uh, Sagittarius of the galaxy, we have some campaigns using uh, radio telescopes and X-ray telescopes in search for these individual millisecond pulsars. Because what we are seeing, we claim, is essentially the bulk emission from a large population of millisecond pulsars. We, uh, according to our modeling, there should be about 700 millisecond pulsars that are shining in gamma rays in the solitary dwarf, and we have some plans to look for them using radio and X-ray telescopes. And we, from the theoretical point of view, we are running some computer simulations where we plan to investigate how likely is it that um, uh, these dual asteroid galaxies of the Milky Way are as clean targets, uh, as, clean targets uh, 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 as people believe in our community. Okay, so we want to understand what is the impact of these millisecond pulsars in our search for that matter in these objects of the Milky Way. Okay, so these are my conclusions. So essentially, these are the take-home messages from our article. So we have detected gamma ray emission from the satellite of the of the galaxy. This is the third most massive satellite of the Milky Way just after the small Magellanic clouds and the large Magellanic clouds. We find that the signal can be explained by the acceleration of electrons of these pulsars by millisecond pulsars. And the discovery casts definitely new light on millisecond pulsars as sources, as efficient sources of cosmic rays in the Milky Way. Okay, thank you very much for your attention, and I'm very happy to take any questions or comments that you might have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dasky Macias. Perfect. Okay, we've got a couple questions here. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you, yes. Uh, my my first question is: Have you detected any point sources in the streams, of the stream that the uh, Sagittarius galaxy has left as it orbited our uh, galaxy? Number one. And my second question is: um, oh, 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 yeah. My second question is: How long would it take uh, for the movement of the Sagittarius uh, dwarf galaxy orbiting our galaxy to, you know, or, or we we, we we should see the, the gamma ray sources moving with the galaxy. I assume that's going to take a long time, but curious to think about, you know, how, how long would it take to detect the movement of the, of the galaxy and those point sources within the galaxy itself? And my third question is, uh, uh, is there any value in the James Webb Space Telescope looking at the Sagittarius dwarf galaxies? Thank you. Okay, perfect. Okay. 
Very well. Okay, so okay, so like okay, so these are great questions. Thank you. <laughs> so okay, so the first one uh, related to the uh, point sources in the stream. So that's a great point. So as a matter of fact, uh, I have a master student uh, working precisely on this project. So essentially, what we have done is so let me basically just provide some context for the audience. Uh, so unfortunately, I don't have details of uh, this here in my in my slides. But so essentially, the yeah. So the so let me just rephrase the question. So the idea is that this is a stellar stream, and so if we find means the compulsors in the core, then we should also yeah we could also hope to uh, detect potentially also means the compulsors in the stream. Uh, and so uh, we are, so I'm working on a project with a master student, so Thomas Benville uh, in Australia, National Australian University. And what we have done is we have taken uh, data again from the Gaia satellite, and we have constructed uh, some sophisticated maps for this stellar stream. So we have created some stellar maps similar to the ones that we created for the core of the dwarf, but now for the stream, stellar stream. And um, so we, our results are not yet uh, published, but we have preliminary results where we essentially show that we are, are not, we have not detected the stellar stream in gamma rays. And so these are very preliminary results and we need to still uh, understand why there are no gamma rays coming from these uh, stellar stream. Uh, but regarding point sources then, so basically we are looking at bulk gamma ray emission from the stellar stream and definitely we are not detecting significant emission from the stellar stream, but uh, that's a different, but uh, that's related somehow with the uh, your question regard, related to point sources. So, Point sources, searches in the stellar stream, it's something that we have not attempted yet. I think it's definitely something worth uh, considering. The, there is uh, one limitation and is the fact that uh, with gamma rays, we don't have uh, a way to measure distance. So we only, and so we could observe gamma rays that are basically overlap with the stellar stream, but we, since we don't have a good grasp for the distance, we we could just claim in principle that they are in the same light of sight, but it's very difficult to claim that a point source belongs to the stellar stream. And so I think it's a good, is definitely something worth looking into, but I think my fear is that it's going to be hard to claim that even if we attack a gamma ray that overlaps with the stellar stream, that it belongs to a stellar stream. So I think for now what we are doing, just basically taking a map for the stellar stream and then doing the statistical analysis is probably the best hope to do that. But unfortunately, we find that it's not, um, we are not finding any, any interesting signals related to the stellar stream yet. Now, the second point uh, related to the uh, motion or potentially find some evidence for motion in the uh, gamma rays that's I think a very uh, very good point so we did find some mild significance for uh, the motion of the satellite in our in our in, in in our analysis so let me see if I have something in my backup um I should have something in the backup images uh, yes. So, yeah, so one analysis that we did was we essentially took our stellar template and then we computed the statistical significance of moving this, this stellar template in, uh, in this region of the sky and then basically ask what was the significance of detecting of basically moving this stellar, stellar map around the region of the, of the uh, thermical cone. And so what we find is that there is some evidence for some excess also very close to the, um, to the core of the Sagittarius Dwarf. And we interpret this in our article that this is 
the signature of the motion of the Sagittarius Dwarf. So the Sagittarius Dwarf is moving towards the north, as you see here. And so essentially what happens is that this is our interpretation of this result is that as the Sagittarius Dwarf moves towards the north, then there is a magnetic field stream that is uh, created by the motion of some gas, some uh, galactic gas that is basically disrupted there. And so that motion of ionized gas produces magnetic fields. And then the electrons that are being accelerated or injected from the second pulsars just spiral down the stream of these magnetic fields and could be responsible for this excess of gamma rays displaced from the core of the solitary zone. And so, yeah, so actually we find that uh, there is indeed potentially actually a signature for the motion of the dwarf in the eta array. So that's a really good point. And so this is uh, kind of a second, secondary uh, kind of claim in our, in our paper that we there is definitely something uh, related to the to, to motion of the solitary zone. And then your last point is related to the James Webb, uh, the impact of the James Webb uh, telescope. So James Webb is a um, it's an infrared telescope, right? And so, um, and so potentially with uh, James Webb, we could observe, um, we could trace better maps for the stellar uh, population, and so. With infrareds, one could observe, for instance, red clump giants, and red clump giants are some of the oldest stars. And so, um, and so, I think I think I, there is actually there something there, something interesting there, because millisecond pulsars uh, are so according to our modeling, these millisecond pulsars have about a thousand million years, and red clump giants have tradition, so have also that kind of age, so about a thousand million years to 10,000 million years. And so if we assume that uh, uh, the kinematic history of red clump giants or these old stars are the same as musical pulses because they both are old star populations, then one could in principle find a good proxy for the distribution of musical pulses. Okay, so hopefully that answers your question, but yeah, I think those are those were very insightful uh, questions. Thank you very much for that. All yeah. right, thank you, Dr. Macias. Thank you everybody for attending this evening for the March general meeting. Uh, we'll see you next month. Perfect, thank you very much. Have a good one. All right, and thank you all the Zoom members for joining tonight.